In tonight's video, I'm going to service a Sony STJX520A. This is an AM stereo, FM stereo home tuner that Sony put out. It's my own personal piece. I've had it for years. It's broken and we're going to fix it tonight. So in today's video, I'm going to look at an old Sony. This is an STJX520A. And as you can see, it's an FM stereo, AM stereo tuner. This is quite a rare piece that Sony had. And this is my own piece. I've had this since it was new. It was part of my system. Unfortunately, it got scratched due to other components and stuff being placed on top of it. I was always a firm believer that you, you didn't put anything on top of your amplifier due to concerns of heat. So the amplifier went on top and the tuner was on the bottom of the stack just because the tuner is not going to produce much in the way of heat. I have a cat in here that's going to be driving me crazy. This unit's got a couple problems. One, the backlight for the display is burned out. So we're going to replace that. The second fault with this one is the battery that maintains the memory is, uh, is gone. So we're going to replace that. Third fault on this is when I tried to receive an AM stereo signal from the AM stereo transmitter that I built, which my both my two, my, my two Walkmans receive in stereo, my boombox receives in stereo, my Sony car radio receives in stereo, and my Motorola car radio receives in stereo. So I know that the transmitter is in fact putting out a stereo signal, but on this one, it doesn't. So we're gonna go through the AM stereo circuit and see whether I can get it to receive a signal in stereo. And I do have the service manual for this thing. Take a look at this. There it is, the STJX 520A Canadian model service manual, FM stereo, AM stereo tuner by Sony. This is the only tuner that Sony made that had AM stereo. They also had a receiver, which I don't have. I wish I did. Oh, the cat wants out. I'll let the cat out now. Go away. That's my cat with its crooked tail. And everybody thinks that the cat had its tail caught in the screen door because it looks like its tail is broken, but it actually was born that way. The mother cat has a crooked tail and all the kittens all had crooked tails. It's kind of funny. Um, okay, so the only two radios that Sony made that had AM stereo that I don't personally own is the, the uh, table radio and the other tuner, the receiver. Anyway. Because I was, when I was buying my stereo equipment, I was one of these people that was a firm believer that you got better performance from individual components. So I had a separate preamp, a separate power amp, a separate tuner, a separate CD player. I had all ES stuff. And I've, I've still got a few of those pieces. The ES DAT machine. I've got the ES uh, CD changer. I had an ES uh, power amp at the time. I sold it. I was That was kind of dumb. Should have kept it. I had the ES... Um, uh, preamp and I had this which is not an ES component but close enough okay uh, let's get the top off the thing take a look inside it and see what's in this thing I've already taken the, the uh, screws out so we'll just lift the top off we can get a look inside this unit so here's the unit this is going to be the battery that's dead right here that's going to be a little lithium cell that we're going to change out and in here we have the, there's a power supply over here and uh, standby, where's there, I think the standbys were actually fed right off the main power transformer if I'm not mistaken on this. I'm pretty sure it is. I don't think there was a second standby on this one. Anyway, um, what do you got back here? This is the, this is the, the, the remote control. They called it function control and control S. This was actually the brains for all of the other equipment. So it would actually send a signal out to control other components. So you could control your tape deck and your CD player and everything. And they use this proprietary four pin connector and you could daisy chain everything together. So that's that, the remote module. There's the remote receiver here and it plugs into this. So this is the remote control um, for this unit. You've got your uh, AM FM front end, the tuner is here. You've got your IF strip, 
Um, this is going to be, I believe this is the FM IF strip, is this part of it here. And, uh, and, and this is the AM circuitry over here. Yeah, marked AM. And then this is the common IF that's common to both AM and FM. And then this board over here has two functions. One, it has a little relay on it because it has two antenna inputs. So that just switches the, uh, the FM antenna between antenna 1 and antenna 2. The AM, um, I think the AM antenna plugs into here as well and it comes up. It comes up to here as well. This is the AM stereo board. This is the decoder board that does all of the AM stereo detection. And there'll be a couple of ICs, I'm sure, mounted on the bottom side of the board underneath here. There's only a few adjustments on this thing that, that can be made. Um, before I do anything else, oh, there's another IC here soldered on the other side of the board. You can see it. They've cut it through but it's actually surface mounted. That'll be the, the micro. Uh, before I do anything else, let's get the circuit board out so that I can uh, change the battery. It looks like I changed it once before and I just clipped it off and soldered the new one down on top of it, so maybe we'll do the same. Save me taking the whole thing apart. But I gotta change out the light on this thing because the light bulb is burned out. As it sits, the receiver does work though. Okay, I'm just receiving some royalty free stuff from my little transmitter that's sitting you know, 10 feet from me here, MP3 player transmitter. If I switch over, there, now it's in stereo. Stereo light's on. If I switch over to AM, oh, we're in, we're in the wrong mode here. Let's see if I can change this. I think it's that, I think that turns it on. No, or is it, or is it volume, or tuning down and power? Or is it tuning up and power? There we go. Tuning up and power changes it from nine to 10 kilohertz. If I go up to my my uh, signal here, it should be on 1440, I think, but it won't light up in stereo because, well, it didn't before, so I don't think it's going to improve now since I haven't done anything to it. But we'll see if I can pick it up here. Yeah, there's my signal, complete with all its hum. I just have to rotate the antenna a bit to try and minimize that. because it's really critical placement for the antenna. I get so much interference, but as you can see, I'm not uh, picking up anything in stereo here. There's IF band normal and wide. But we're gonna try and get this thing working in stereo while I'm at it. As you can hear, the hum that I was getting, it's all dependent on where I placed the antenna. The hum is not really getting into the transmitter, it's actually getting into the radio. It's from interference from electrical, and that was part of the problem with AM, right? See, it's minimized there. It all depends on where I place the antenna. And that's why these came with an external antenna, right? They called it the wave catcher for the AM, right? Layout free AM antenna. That way you could, you could set this on top of your cabinet and position it for the best reception because for AM placing the antenna is critical so anyway let's uh, get the battery changed out on this thing first I'll turn off the power here change out the battery and I gotta find something to put in there for a light it's gonna be a 12 volt incandescent and I'm likely gonna put it some put an LED in there too just because I don't have any 12 volt incandescent bulbs that I can put in so I'll put in a, a white LED or something in there I'm sure Anyway, let me go find a battery for this thing first, because I know I've got one. I just brought one in for it. Well, I'll start by removing the screws here so we can remove the circuit board. My intent is I'm going to put this tuner back into service. I've got an old analog tuner in, in my office that I use to listen to the radio on when I listen to the radio, um, which is nice. I, I like the analog tuner because, of course, with a, with a real tuning capacitor, you can find stations in between, so forth. So, to, so uh, manual tuning is always nice, but uh, uh, this one here with its preset memories and two antenna inputs, I can have two different antennas on this thing 
Uh, so I think I'll probably end up putting this thing back into service once I get it uh, fixed up. Just gonna cut that uh, that tie tie down there. So I can, as you can see, this board's never been out of this thing. And you know, all the time I've owned this thing, I've fixed it a couple times, and I've always done it the easy way. This time I'm gonna do things the less easy way, but the right way. Just because if I don't, I'll generate more thumbs down. So I'll generate enough anyway. I'll unplug the control from here. Okay, I should be able to lift the board out. Oh, one more. I guess I'm going to have to take out. Oh, maybe I can just unplug this. There. I should be able to lift the board out now, I think. Maybe not. I probably am going to have to cut this last one. connectors here so that I can tip the unit over and get to the bottom of the display. To remove this cover on the display I just release these two little catches and this cover comes off and you'll see that there's the light that's in behind here and all it is is an incandescent bulb with a little blue cover over it. And that's all they did was they just put a little light bulb in there. You can see the display is completely transparent you can actually see through it because the, the diffuser is off. So I'll start by replacing the battery. Check this out, this is called a resistor array. This is what Sony would do when they wanted to, now they do this all in like a, like a, a thick film IC, but back in the day they would just take, you know, six or seven resistors or whatever they wanted and they would just crimp all the ends together. Anyway, I got the board swing out of the way here so that I can remove the battery and we'll get the new battery in. Here's the control IC here. This is the display driver IC. It's a Toshiba chip. And you can see it. this is what drives the whole dis entire display. You can see all the, the traces coming off of this chip because it's a direct drive, not multiplexed chip, I believe, on this one. Um, okay, the battery is uh, going to be, I think it's these terminals right there, if I'm not mistaken. So let's remove the old battery. Iron is up to temperature. There we go, the old battery is out. We'll get the new one here. And polarity is important. But on this unit, if you put it in backwards, you're not going to do any damage because, uh, well, there's a diode here that will protect it. This diode is more for so the battery doesn't get charged. But it'll also, if you put it in backwards, it'll stop it from it'll stop it from damaging anything. But that there is so that when it is plugged in, there's power applied through here, and the diode will stop the battery from charging because you don't you don't want to charge a lithium battery. And it would be bad. You'd, you'd have major sparks. So. Here's the new battery, paying attention to polarity. The board is marked, positive and negative. I believe that's what it says. And of course, my spacing is not quite the same for this one. We'll just... Uh, Clear some solder off here. I 
wonder how many of my friends in the south are going to correct me and tell me that, that, that the proper way to pronounce it is solder, which is not the case. The L is definitely not silent. They speak different down there. It's the same as uh, we call it a roof and they call it a roof. Got some moss on the roof. My roof has a leak. Okay, there's the battery is connected. Well, it was until I took it out, but now it is again. Okay, now we'll get that light bulb, which is right here. I think this is the bulb. So we'll just unsolder that. And we're going to replace it with a couple of LEDs. Put a couple of LEDs in series, I think will do the job. Uh, I'm pretty sure this was probably either 9 or 12 volts. This one had a blue cover over it, so if I want to keep the color the same, well, I've got some blue LEDs. Why not, right? But that's how Sony used to color their lights. They just put a regular incandescent bulb over it, and they put a little light bulb condom over the top of it to uh, change the color to whatever they wanted. It was a cheap way of getting color before LEDs were common. Of course now everything would be done with an LED but back then this is the way it was done so I guess now what I'll do is I'll um, I'll measure the polarity here I'm gonna have to reconnect power obviously to do this so this is gonna be a little more of a challenge because uh, I need to be able to power this thing up so that I can check the polarity to see which one's positive and negative for the light Unless I can see it here. Uh, one of these should go back to the ground, I would think. So let's see if I can measure it. Figure out which one of these uh, is negative. So here's our terminals. Uh, that one's negative. Because I, I went to the negative terminal of the battery, so negative, and this one here will be positive, and this one's going to go down, probably down to a transistor that controls it. I'm thinking down here somewhere, maybe to this one. Where does this go? It goes to this lead here, which comes down here, and it goes to a regulator transistor. Okay, so that's, that's the positive terminal there, because I'm going to... Q509, which is a regulator a transistor. Okay, so let me get some blue LEDs and we'll string a few of them in series and then uh, put a resistor on there to limit the current and uh, that should uh, give us some light. So basically what we're gonna do is we're just gonna connect the, the, the cathode of one to the anode of, of another. Of course, the cathode is the one with the uh, longer lead, I think. No, that's the anode. The cathode's one with the shorter lead, the flat side. So we're just gonna connect the anode and cathode of opposing LEDs together. So we'll just take those like that. We'll space them out. We'll space them out an inch or so from each other so that they cover the entire length of the display. But we'll just put three of them together and uh, put them in front of this little, I think probably put them in front of this little shield. What this did was this limited the amount of light. And, oh, actually, what this did is this reflected the light so there was no hot spot is what it did. This threw the light to the back of this cover, right? That little shield that's here, the light filament sat in front of that. And what that did was that reflected the light to the back of this, of this piece to reflect it around. So we're going to put the three LEDs in and we're going to face them back, either up or face them towards the back so that the light actually reflects off the back of this and over the uh, 
I'll put that on here to protect the LCD screen. That'll help protect it. So we're going to put the LEDs in the back here so that they, they fire their light into this little cabinet. You can see from the heat, eh? This thing over the years, the heat from the light actually discolors the plastic. So we won't have to worry about that anymore. But we're going to put them so that they face towards the back here so that I get a nice even light. And three LEDs in this thing will give more than enough light for sure. There's one put together. So I've got my cathode here on the uh, left, my anode on the right, cathode on the left, anode on the right, and on this one here we'll do the same thing. We'll put the cathode on the left, which is the shorter of the two leads. I'll go find myself a resistor now to limit the current. I'm going to go with about a 220 ohm resistor on here. Uh, that should be plenty for if, if 12 volt uh, or even 9 volt. I don't know what the input is, but it, it's not. I wouldn't be more than 12 volts. But let's just take a, I'll take a look at this. I'll power my power supply. I'm going to power this up. I think my power supply is set for 9 volts here. So now my power supply is set for 9 volts. So we'll just take a look at uh, what this looks like. Negative to the to the cathode and positive to the resistor and at 9 volts I'm drawing uh, 0 0.02 watts 0 0.003 amps at 9 volts even at 12 volts it's going to go up to maybe 0 0.04 but that I think we more than bright enough there's plenty of light coming off there I think to, to, to light up the display so let's uh, mount this down on the board and then I can put the board back in and uh, see how the display looks and then we'll work on getting the uh, uh, AM stereo working. Just on a note here, I was looking in the manual and the part number for that battery, BA401 from Sony, I got a price on here, $25.92 is what Sony charged for a CR2025 with mounting tabs on it. And I bought this one. Uh, I think I paid three dollars for it for an aftermarket, not from Sony pricing, because well, anything you bought from Sony, any parts that you bought from Sony, there was a huge premium if it came from Sony. That was just the way. That was just the way it was. And the old one was an original one. I had actually. I had actually bought an original Sony one and I was too lazy to take the board out so I just cut the other one out and just soldered it down. But that would have been, I would have ordered that right from Sony. You see it's a Sony CR2025 so that would have been an original battery that I paid way too much for back in the day, the last time it was replaced. I'm probably also okay calling them bandits. Those bandits at Sony would have charged somebody just an arm and a leg for that, uh, to change that battery. If someone brought this unit in and the the fault was the battery needed to be replaced. It would have probably cost them, you know, a hundred dollars. I kid you not. Back in the day, because uh, I mean, they just they would just charge whatever they wanted, right? And uh, you either wanted your your stereo fixed, or you didn't. It was simple as that. It was, uh, I remember when I first, one of the reasons I got into electronic service to begin with was uh, back in the late 70s, I bought a VCR, an RCA Select Division. And I had a problem with it that, that most people that own VCRs had, and that was I had heads that got clogged up due to a bad tape and it went in to the RCA service center and uh, came back with the heads cleaned and a bill that was close to a hundred dollars and 
and I I thought this thing was supposed to be covered under warranty because you know the machine had only I'd only had it for a few months, and there was no rental tapes back then. You you, you there was no rental business back in 1979. The rental business didn't actually get going until well into the 80s, but uh, in 79 there was really no place to rent tapes. There was a there was a, a store that would rent porn tapes, but that was about it. There wasn't really much in the way of a, a rental market. And uh, that didn't start for a few more years. So the tape that, that gave me trouble was actually a counterfeit tape that I didn't know was counterfeit when I bought it. Back in the day, uh, VHS tape was, uh, I think they were close to $50 for what they called a VK250, which is also known as a T120. But uh, RCA sold it with their, under their own numbering system and they called it a VK250. There we go. That should fit in there quite nicely. And uh, the, 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 the RCA tapes, because RCA was one of the few companies that sold VCRs back in 79, you go to the, the store and it was 50 bucks. And there was a, a store called Video Only that was selling less expensive tapes. Not, you know, they were they weren't name brand. I think it was called a Trimax or something, right? But they were just, we didn't know what counterfeit tape was. This was the very first experience I had with counterfeit tape. And uh, of course it contaminated the heads. Well, we all learned about bad tapes really quick after that, but uh, it contaminated the heads and the machine went in for service and it came back with a huge bill. And that was one of the, after I paid the bill to have this thing cleaned and have it clog up again within a few weeks, and go back to the service department and then give me another big bill of close to a hundred dollars that was what that was basically the, the, the what made me decide hey maybe I should get into VCR repair there's good money in this and there was there was uh, when we were cleaning heads we were we weren't the shop I was at after I worked for Sony the shop I worked for I think we charged thirty dollars to clean heads but I would do 20 of them a day 30 bucks, 30 bucks, 30 bucks, 30 bucks, 30 bucks. Made a lot of money cleaning heads on VCRs, I tell you. Okay, let's plug this thing in now and see how this thing looks. These plugs are keyed, so they only go into the one one plug which was nice and ones that are that do have the same number of pins if they're close to each other they make them a different color so plug all the plugs together get all the wires out of the way and we'll put the board back down and uh, see whether this thing how it looks I'm betting it's gonna look pretty good the board back in place. All important ground screw. The moment of truth. at this it's beautiful beautiful that display that's oh I got dust in there I have to take it apart and blow the dust out that's the best that things looked in years it even looks better than the original color which was kind of a it was it was a bluey green color with that blue uh, 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 cover over top of the incandescent but that ah, looks spectacular excellent it's just the angle of the camera that makes it look brighter it's actually uniformly that it looks really good. Uh, there it is. Oh, beautiful. Nice deep blue. I love it. That looks spectacular for this display. 
Let's see if I can memorize some stations, if I can remember how to do this. Memory one, let's tune some stations in here and see if it will maintain the uh, memory. Memory two, we'll just go through and get some of the local stations in here. That won't work. Yeah, memory three. Memory four. Six. Seven. Were made for indigo. I just eight. Listen to the AM band too and see how that how well it does. And of course I have to move my antenna a bit here to minimize the the hum. But see it's not receiving stereo, so we have a problem. We have a problem with the reception. So according to this thing for the adjustment of the AM stereo, I'm going to, I don't have a stereo, I have, well, I don't have a stereo generator, I have a stereo transmitter close enough. It says set your generator to uh, CQAM, Motorola system. And I'm supposed to connect the generator into here, but I'm just going to receive off air because, again, I don't have a, a function, an RF, AM, RF signal generator with an AM stereo modulator to, to feed into the external input. So uh, it says to set it to 455 kilohertz because that's the, uh, the IF. And it says the just T801. So the VOM reads uh, 2.4 at test point number one. So I got to find test point one which is going to be looks like it's on cn the c810 c810 there we go so here's c810 so it's the negative terminal of a, a little tantalum capacitor and it's supposed to read it says adjust t801 so that the vom reads 2.4 volts and i'm getting 1.1 .1. so the adjustment that i have to make on this thing here is t801 where is T801? RT, RT, T801. Uh, okay, T801. Okay, that's this little, this little transformer right down here. Let's see if I can adjust this. So that we get the voltage where it belongs. going down it's supposed to read 2.4 volts and it's not coming up very much is it it's going down so our voltage is low so why is our voltage low so I'm just continuing to measure some voltages here there's your C806, I'm getting 0.6 volts, and C806, here on the schematic, I'll back this camera out a bit so you guys can see what I'm looking at here a bit. Maybe I can't. Anyway, C C806 in the lock detector says it should be 0.7 volts or stereo, 0 0.5 for mono. It's coming up to 0.6 volts. They may have a little, one of these little caps in here has gone bad, right? That's what I'm thinking. Um, I'm gonna pull the stereo board out of this thing so we can start checking some parts in here. Just 
disconnect the antenna. And here is the bottom of the AM stereo board. Here's the two chips. Sony developed chips, of course, or at least one of them is. Uh, are they both Sony? One's a Sony chip. That'll be the multi-mode decoder, I'm sure. What are the other ones here? What do we got in this thing? Yeah, they're both Sony tips, chips. So these are both custom. These are both custom-made chips for the AM stereo decoder. C801 and C80 or IC801 and IC802. These two here. These are custom Sony chips that were developed specifically for AM stereo. Whenever I see these rubber pieces on here, I always have to wonder: Did the uh, underside of it get corroded by by glue but it looks okay here so I'm just going to grab my ESR meter and we're going to start checking caps for ESR for that ESR in this circuit Five point four. These are point forty seven. So that that's going to be okay, I'm sure. They don't measure very. They'll measure quite a bit, actually. Put this one down here. And those ones are all so far so good. Hmm. I guess it won't receive anything without the antenna hooked up to it. So we're going to measure some voltages here on IC802. So looking at the logic, pin 1 should be 3.5 volts, which it is. 
two should be 1.6, which is 1.5, 1.53, close enough. Pin three should be about 1.6, and that was low. Oh no, 1.53, that's good. Pin four should be the same. Pin four is 1.53, so that's okay. Uh, pin five should be about 1.8. Pin five is 2.4. That's a phase lock loop. Hmm. Pin six should be 2.7. 2.8. Okay, then it's the pilot adjustment which is RT802. So we make sure that that's set to 2.7 volts. RT802, where's 802? There's the pilot adjustment right here. So I'm just gonna make sure that, that is set correctly. So pin six should be 2.7 volts. Pin six, 2.7. six I believe. Yeah 2.7 on pin number six. Just gonna make sure it's the right voltage. Pin number six, 2.7 on pin six. One, two, three, four, five. doesn't change. Oh, that's interesting. That doesn't change. Hmm. It's too high. It's two point it's two point eight and it should be two point seven volts. Okay, that's being pulled high inside this chip from what? Because <sighs> the pilot adjustment just, the wiper goes through R817, that was a 360K to ground, but that's only to set the bias. The voltage is going to be coming out of the chip here. Lock detector. Looks like some of the other voltage is going into this IC. Our inputs are pin 13 and 14. Pin 13 and pin 14 are over here. So pin 13 is 1.5 and pin 14 is 1.5. And they are, yeah, they're pretty close. It says between 1.2 and 1.4 should be my inputs. Pin 15 should be 2.6. It's high. It's three volts. Pin 16 should also be 2.6. It's three volts. It's too high as well. Pin 17 should also be the same. It's three volts. It's a little high too. 
of pin number 18. These are going into four filter capacitors, three volts. So the lock detector is a little high on both. Interesting. That ties into the, what they call the safety logic here, which I think is designed to keep the unit from falsely going into stereo. So either it's detecting that my stereo signal is not perfect and it's keeping it locked out or there's a fault in the circuit. I'm blaming the circuit right now because all the other radios that I, I play, uh, they're received in stereo. This is the only one that's not. So I'm leaning towards something in the circuit here that's, that's causing a problem and not a distorted signal on the transmitter because if that was the case I would expect that other radios would also not detect stereo and they are. So that's where we are on this one. Okay, I'm making some progress here, just, just testing stuff out. I'm supposed to have 2.4 volt, 2 volts at test point one of the, uh, by adjusting T801 and I've now got my voltage to 2.44 volts, which is right where we're supposed to be. Test point one, 2.4 volts here, whereas I, where am I here? Uh, FM stereo, or AM stereo, 2.4 volts. And I'm going to adjust RT802 so they get 2.7 volts at test point 2. Let's see if I can get 2.7 volts at test point 2. I get 2.4. Let's see if I can get to Still not on a stereo light on. Oh wait a minute. Put it in stereo. It was in mono mode there. So with that 2.7 volts, I got 2.4. Uh, it's gone up to 4. Hmm. So that's correct. 2.4, you see I can adjust it. Adjusting this transformer here. And 2.4, so that's correct. Yeah, I still don't have any stereo detection. Weird. As you can see, if I move the antenna around.
tracking adjustment. What am I measuring here? So we do 1.8 volts. Okay, go 1.8 volts. I'm making progress. I got a nasty noise in there, but I'm making progress. Slowly but surely, I'm making progress. Let's see if I can. I'm just adjusting the pilot. It might be my signal is kind of screwed here. I got a lot of noise here from lights and stuff. Mono. I got stereo. I got it working in stereo though. You can see the light here. I gotta deal with that hum. Go off frequency. Auto zone in the Okay. Let's try just tweaking my frequency a bit here. Despite all the hum I'm getting in there, um, it was right. At, it was these .47s that I was just kind of playing around with when it kicked in. They may be the pro they may be the uh, the cause. It's uh, C802 and C806. Yeah, if I look up C802 and C806, give me a schematic here. They're point forty sevens, and they were eight oh two. C eight oh six and C eight zero two point forty seven. And they go right into IC eight oh one. And if we look at them here. I see 801 is over here. So 802 is this one feeding into the buffer. And 806 is the lock detector. 
Now, 802 shows as a .01, and it's a .47 for sure. But this one here, 806, in the lock detector, that would certainly, I think, have an effect on it going to, into AM stereo. So maybe we'll try changing those caps. Maybe it was 805 and 806. It looked like 802. Let me just go back and look, because the other one, the other one's over here. Eight oh five and eight oh six. Looks like eight oh two. But it's definitely an eight oh two. Eight oh five is next to. Oh wait a minute. Eight oh two is. Yeah, it's eight oh five. Next eight oh two. Eight oh two is down here. It's next to it. So eight oh five and eight oh six. That would make more sense. For point forty seven. And one of them is right, say right, right uh, where is it? 806 is here, the lock detector. And 805 is over here going into the distortion control. Let's see if I got a couple of .47s. I do have a couple of them. So let's just change those out. Because I was just I was just kind of tinkering around with those two caps and I, I gave them the, the wet finger test when I ran my finger over them here on the bottom. This is when it kicked into stereo. Right when I ran my finger over those two. And those are the two that uh, I suspect might be part of the problem. Look at the difference in size, right? They're 0.4750 volt. They're both the same rating, but this is the new ones and these are the old ones here. So we'll just take those out. Okay, see if it works again. Kicked in the stereo. I think it's humming last too. Well, it's kicked in the stereo right away now. Okay, that fixed the stereo detector. Wow. Now we can just get this hum to go away. It just. The problem is that I got so many bloody fluorescent lights around here, that's the problem. And uh, my my little stereo transmitter is on the other side of the house, so it's the signal is pretty weak in here. And it's a careful positioning of the antenna, I can minimize that noise, but um, the, these low power AM transmitters that you build, you know, 100 milliwatts, 200 milliwatts, 400 milliwatts, you know, it's, uh, you don't go very far, like they only have a, a range of you know, I can get, I can pick it up in my car about one lot over either side of the house. The, the signal is really, really weak. It's not like FM. If you had 400 milliwatts on FM, well, you'd probably pick the thing up through the entire town with, an, with a half decent antenna. And I'm going to be building an FM transmitter too. We'll, we'll see how, we'll see how far it goes. But um, AM is uh, AM doesn't go very far. When I listen to my home-built AM transmitter on the radio, that's on the other side of the room, it sounds fine. I don't have any hum, I don't have any hum or anything. But uh, I just get it's just so much interference here from all these bloody fluorescent lights and uh, my monitors going here. You know, and if I move the antenna around, you'll probably hear it. Listen, if I move the antenna close to things like like the TV and stuff. Right. It's just so much interference on AM. But it's working in stereo. Narrow band. Mono. There's mono. Let's see if I can adjust 
adjust that to... Oh, that buzz, by the way, was my scope. Listen. That's my digital scope. That's how much noise I get. But my radio, my tuner's working now. Thank God. Let's see if I can... I'm just going to remount this board because it, it'll have proper shielding when I mount the thing. We'll see how it sounds, but I think I got my tuner fixed. Yes, excellent. One thing about this is these nuts that hold on the antenna jacks, well, they're not normal size. These have actually got dual threads. As you'll notice, they'll slide right over the normal cable thread. They actually have secondary threads here that tighten these up and provide the bond for the grounding of this module to the chassis. There we go, got it back together. As I say, I'm still getting, I'm on narrow band now, I've got a wide band, a bit more of a hum a bit. I'm still getting a bit of hum, but again, I, there is a bit of hum on that uh, transmitter because I don't have it properly grounded for one. I still don't have it properly grounded. And, uh, it's the signal's not very strong, but it is in stereo. Narrow band. Mono, mono. Stereo. I play with the antenna, it will affect. I'm still getting hum in here. I bet you if I moved, I bet you if I moved this thing closer to the transmitter, because see, without without an antenna, I don't even get anything at all. Because the signal's not very strong here. Again, it's on the other side of the house. I bet you if I move this thing closer to the transmitter it's going to sound better but what will be interesting on this is because this has got an external AM and an external ground uh, wire or terminal on the back it would be interesting to see what type of signals I can pull in with say a long wire antenna probably not a heck of a lot right now because there's still a lot of DSL uh, in use in my neighborhood that's going to go away in the spring because the phone company is putting in fiber optic to every address. So the DSL is going to be mostly turned down. I would think maybe a few people that are going to hang on to their copper for whatever reason don't want to upgrade, but most people will upgrade. And the DSL signals that cause so much noise on the AM and the HF bands are going to be going away soon. Can't wait. But uh, there it is. It's it's fixed. I'll hook this other antenna back up again to it again. To give you how to give you an idea how touchy it is, watch this. When I touch the unit, the hum goes away. That is uh, how crazy. That's how crazy the AM is with it with this thing. It's just it's it's nuts. But again, it's signal related. So there's the unit back together and uh, looking great with that new blue LED light for the display here. Another neat thing about these, this unit is it had these little inserts that you could pull out and it might have all fallen apart but you uh, put a piece of tape across the back and then you can stick in little pieces of paper with your radio stations written on the front of it. Originally it came with little tags that you could drop in there, right? You could pick off the frequency, like, you know, 96.9 or whatever. I think it said, like, FM 1 to 5 and AM 1 to 5. And you could pick them out and you could put in your own little tags. I actually had one down here that said CFOX 99.7. Well, that would have been with the cable frequency because they broadcast on 99.3. Right, so I put CFOX back into there.
But as you can hear, if I touch it, the hum. If I touch the antenna, it gets worse. Anyway, let's move this thing inside and see how it sounds. Then I can finish up this video because it's gone on far too long. So here it is inside. That's receiving FM from my little FM transmitter that I've got. We'll go to channel 10. Here's AM stereo. As you can hear, it's not humming now because I'm closer to the transmitter. All that noise that we heard when I was in the shop, well, that was because I was in the shop with all the fluorescent lights and stuff. Actually, sounds pretty good. Wide band, a little narrow. Narrow band, so you get crappy AM sound. Mono, mono, the stereo lights out. Uh, stereo, wide band. Mono and wide band. There you go. STJX520. Working again producing AM stereo and FM stereo and man it looks good with the new lighting on there it looks fantastic we'll catch you in the next one coming up real soon bye for now